So first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me in the conference. And uh, what I'm talking about is a result of a collaboration. Uh, two of the members of the collaboration, Pier Francesco and Shamik, are sitting here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now it's better. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I was saying that two of the members of the collaboration, Pier Francesco Di, Di Cintio and Shami Gupta, are sitting here. Unfortunately, Tarsisio Teles is not here. And we missed the opportunity of being all together here. And uh, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, temperature inversion. And I'm now clarifying what do I mean. And uh, this is, uh, the claim is that this is a phenomenon that really is uh, from astrophysical to atomic scale. So it's uh, like the subtitle of the conference in the, in the, op in the reverse order. And I'll, because I will starting from large scales and then going down to small scales. So uh, uh, what I will be talking about. And uh, what do I mean with temperature inversion is that I'm looking at states of uh, systems uh, where you have anti-correlation between the density and the temperature in the system. So you have uh, non-uniform density, non-uniform temperature, but they're anti-correlated. The, the, the system is sparser, it is hotter, and uh, when, the, when it is uh, denser, it's colder. Okay? So it's sort of the opposite of what would... Uh, clearly, these are non-equilibrium states, because otherwise they, they would be isothermal. So they are non-equilibrium. But we have just learned from Julien lecture that these non-equilibrium states can uh, spontaneously appear due to Vlasov uh, evolution in uh, long-range interacting systems, and they live for very long times. And they are typically, in the community, they are typically called quasi-stationary states. And uh, the, the claim of the talk will be that uh, this, uh, this phenomena can be observed uh, from astrophysical scales to atomic scales, even if uh, the known examples are all at the astrophysical level. Um, what, uh, what I will be talking about is not making a... Uh, uh, first, I will review some phenomenology, and then I will not be concerned with uh, <coughs> a precise analysis of some particular case, but just for looking for which are the minimal ingredients and uh, the basic physical mechanism that can give rise to this interesting phenomenon. And uh, in, in, it will, uh, in my opinion, it, it uh, comes out that uh, really you just need inhomogeneous states and long-range interactions plus some other ingredients that will be. Okay. So this is one example of universality in long-range systems in the sense of uh, Julien talked before. And, uh, okay, we'll see how it, uh, it will be relevant, a concept that is called uh, velocity filtration that I will uh, uh, spend some time about for a while. Now, what do I mean more precisely with temperature inversion? Is a, a, a system like that. You have uh, that your density is non-homogeneous, it decreases, for example, along a given direction, and then you have that your temperature rises along the same direction, okay? Uh, one pre uh, I have to precise that what, since we are in a non-equilibrium setting, what do I mean with temperature? Just the usual definition, kinetic definition, that is the locally averaged kinetic energy, what in the, in the astrophysical community we call the velocity dispersion. Okay? Uh, the most known example of a temperature inversion, that is also the field from which I borrowed the name, temperature inversion, is the solar corona, so the outer... Uh, atmosphere of the sun and also other stars. And uh, here, uh, here is the picture. And you have that the, the green curve is the density. The red curve is the temperature. And you see that uh, while the, this, this part is, is, uh, is very sparse, okay, so the density falls down very rapidly, its temperature rises over three, uh, three orders of magnitude. You pass from thousands of kelvins to millions of kelvins. There are other examples less known probably to the, uh, out of the community that studies it, and they, and they are molecular clouds. 
Uh, this is a picture that actually the molecular cloud is not the pinkish uh, region there, and I put that just because the picture is beautiful. But the, <laughs> the molecular clouds are, are, are dark in this, in this picture because they clearly molecule, that one is atomic emission, that's H alpha mainly. And uh, what happens there, a similar thing, then the, you have, uh, you know, this is a plot where uh, the, in the horizontal axis you have something that you can measure, and um, a signal that is roughly proportional to the density of the, uh, of the system. And on the, on the vertical line, you have the velocity dispersion, what, what I would call from a statistical point of view temperature. And you see that they are clearly anti-correlated. Uh, also for uh, uh, molecular clouds, there is this uh, intriguing, uh, there are these intriguing power laws discovered by Richard Larson many years ago. And you see that that seems to be really an anti-correlation uh, anti between velocity dispersion and the density of these structures. Then there are many other examples that may be more, a bit more complicated. Also some, uh, some uh, particular kind of elliptical galaxies that sometimes show an anti-correlation between velocity dispersion and uh, radius that, and still and then density and also the hot gas in galaxy clusters but for various reasons these other examples are less clean so I will not concentrate on them. Now uh, what so for the moment I am at the astrophysical uh, scale because the I mean the, the known examples are from here. Uh, if you look at what is commonly thought, ab thought about this uh, in the astrophysical uh, literature, you see that, there is a, that these, uh, these phenomena are not seen as, a, as examples of something of, uh, of a more general phenomenon. Uh, typically, a specific mechanism is invoked for each case to explain the phenomenology. The most, much more, the most studied, studied phenomenon is uh, also because we have a lot of accurate data is the solar corona, and there are the, uh, essentially two, two uh, di very different kinds of, of explanation of this phenomenon. One uh, that uh, has many, many sub-different explanations is, uh, is the simple idea that there is some mechanism that takes energy and brings it to, towards the, 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 the far regions. It could be done in many ways and uh, and uh, so the, there is really energy injection. So you take energy from somewhere and you put it in the, in the sparse region. Okay? There could be many mechanisms, and I'm, I'm not entering the detail here. Another one is called velocity filtration, and we'll talk about uh, later on. So for the moment, uh, let's see that. Then, uh, for instance, for molecular clouds, the generically is invoked the fact that there is turbulence, and so these are fluids, and uh, that it could be turbulent, but there is not uh, a real... Uh, uh, I mean, a real clear mechanism why you, you can observe these anti-correlations. Then for the other examples that are this, uh, more complicated, uh, the, so let's skip them for the, for the moment. Now, what is this velo velocity filtration mechanism? I, I, I spent some minutes on this because I think that this is really important for, it, it, it's more or less the basic thing that could be unifying all, all this uh, all these things. It's a mechanism that had been uh, proposed in the 1990s to explain the problem of the heating of the solar corona. This was not very well received in the solar physics community, for reasons that maybe we can discuss, but uh, that are not very relevant to, 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 the <coughs> to what I'm going to, to talk about. Uh, and uh, I, I will underline some, some, some uh, limitations of this idea in, in the following. And the idea is, is really very simple, and the model that was proposed by Jack Scudder is, uh, is very, very simple. You think of uh, non-interacting particles that are in, a, in an external field, like a gravity field, for, uh, for instance. Okay? So uh, think of a one-dimensional problem. You have uh, a gravity field, you have a ground, okay? things, uh, for instance, like an atmosphere, or something like that. You, you have a ground level, then you have a potential that brings you down, okay? And you have particles in this, uh, in this situation. And suppose that, that at the ground level, you have a stationary boundary condition. So your distribution function is fixed and, and is stationary. It doesn't depend uh, on, on time. Then what happens in this system? Okay, uh, since the particles are non-interacting, clearly you have, you, 
you can write a collision and Boltzmann equation when the, the force uh, part uh, is uh, yes, okay. The force part uh, is given by the external potential, but uh, clearly in this case it's just energy conservation for the, oh, for the particles, nothing more. But you can write it this way. And uh, what does it mean that the term velocity filtration? The very simple thing that you can find also in Feynman lectures on physics that only particles that at the ground level have sufficient kinetic energy can climb up to a given height. No? You need a sufficient velocity to climb the potential well. That, that's the idea, the simple idea. Now, uh, this, uh, for, for instance, suppose, uh, so you define the, the density this way. Suppose that you have a thermal boundary condition at the ground level. What happens? Uh, I skipped the calculation, it is very easy. It happens this one, that the, the, the temperature stays constant, but clearly density decreases due to the effect of the, uh, of the external field. And this is what's called the isothermal atmosphere. And again, this is an example that you find on textbooks. Okay? Uh, the, what, what Scudder noticed, uh, and uh, was not uh, surprisingly, was not noticed before, is that this result requires that you have a, a thermal boundary condition. But because if the, thermal, the, the, the boundary condition is not thermal, then this is no longer true. And this can be understood uh, from a graphical argument. So suppose that you plot the log of your distribution function against the height, uh, no, sorry, against uh, not, not uh, uh, velocity, but against kinetic energy. And uh, just to have the symmetry, you plot it against uh, signed kinetic energy. So you take positive velocity as negative velocity, but it's a function of p squared, not, not a function of, of p. And uh, what happens? That uh, clearly, since it's Maxwellian, uh, with the log, you, you get this, uh, these straight lines. And uh, you see that uh, how uh, so this, uh, this uh, black line, the, the black dotted line, is the ground level. So the, the, um, the boundary condition that you impose to the system. How can you build uh, the, the distribution function at higher places? Well, you, you just get the, from here, you get the part of the, uh, of the particles that have sufficient velocity to climb there, and only those will go there, but their velocity will be reduced because you need your velocity to, to climb up in the potential well. And so what happens is that you get these parts of the distribution function and glue together at the, at the beginning, and so at the center. And this is the uh, distribution function that you get at a higher point. At an even higher point, you get this one. You see they're all parallel here. Indeed, if you want to calculate the temperature, they have to rescale by, by the density. And if you do that, the, the, the points collapse. So that's the reason why the system is isothermal, because you have this scaling, this collapsing. But suppose that you start with a non-thermal, and in, in particular with something that is suprathermal, that is, that its tails are fatter than a Maxwellian. Then if you do the same, it's, they, they will no longer collapse. And what happens by doing just this cutting of the distribution function and gluing together at the center is that you will have the, the temperature increases because the tails are higher. So the, the higher you go and the broader the distribution is. That's scatter observation. Just this, but it's very simple, very effective. So what, what you get, the picture that I showed you at the very beginning. So you, you get an a increasing temperature while rising, while the density is growing down, okay? So there is a, why this is very interesting, because it is a simple and general mechanism that, that doesn't require any exotic uh, ingredient or specific ingredient of a given system. This is something that could be completely general. Okay, uh, clearly there are some problems. First, okay, uh, to, to the first order, you can even consider your particles not interacting, but then there are interactions. And so, what about interactions? Then, the other point, and this was the major criticism that, what be, that has been done in the solar physics community to this uh, idea, to solve the specific problem of coronal heating, is that, okay, since you need a non-thermal boundary condition, that it should be some mechanism that keeps your boundary layer out of equilibrium. And nobody knows <laughs> which could be. So 
it, it, it's a very strong uh, uh, condition and is something that uh, uh, you have to impose. So again, is a sort of an active ad hoc ingredient that you have to put in your SIPs. Okay, uh, my idea is now to show that this idea is that can, can work in a much broader context. And to do this, I will use a toy model, or as uh, Julien told, the toy model of long-range interaction that is called the Hamiltonian mean field of a H, a HMF model. And here I show you a possible way to derive this, uh, this model, uh, just to show that it's really very general. The uh, possibility is that you take a generic long-range interacting system, then you restrict to one dimension with periodic boundary conditions, and then you expand your potential in a Fourier series just taking the, 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 first, uh, the first contribution. And you end up with the HMF, this one. And this can be interpreted in two ways, either as a, as a model of particles moving on a ring, or as, a, as a Julien told, as a model of spins with the, on a complete graph, so with mean field interaction. It's a, a matter of taste, <laughs> which one you, you like. Now, uh, we, we have just learned that uh, at least uh, for a, for, uh, below a given uh, time scale, the, the dynamics of this system is governed by the Vlasov equation that is written this way. And uh, when well, you have the self-consistent part, then you may have also an external field. And uh, what happens is that you have uh, uh, what Linden Bell called the violent, re violent relaxation. So on a short time scale, you rearrange your initial condition. You end up on a quasi-stationary states. And then eventually, but really eventually, you may go to thermal equilibrium. Now, observe this. Suppose that you are, that you are in a quasi-stationary states. So you can, as far as uh, Vlasov is the equation, you can say that uh, your uh, F is stationary. Suppose that the net effect of the possible external field plus the um, collective mean field is attractive, then this Vlasov equation is essentially the same equation that I showed you for the, for the Scarden model, that are essentially the same. So this uh, phenomenon of velocity filtration may induce a temperature inversion also in the HMF model. So, without the need of, of a boundary condition, but just giving this as an initial condition. So you take an initial distribution function that is, uh, uh, that is not thermal, okay? And uh, you, you let it evolve. If, if the tails of the, the distribution do survive the, first in the, initial, uh, the initial fast evolution, and this clearly nobody knows, but uh, you, you look, uh, and then you may expect that this happens. Actually, this happens. And uh, typically, the, the, this kind of initial states do survive the viral relaxation. So you observe the well, uh, temperature inversion. You see, you have, this, is density, uh, this is temperature, and this is density. You see, where, where it is low, it is high, and the uh, other way. And uh, that was the first observation we made on this. But this is not the most important. Now, so the uh, first thing is, is this, uh, that this mechanism uh, is actually more general than Scudder thought, because it works also with long-range interactions, and uh, really does not need a stationary boundary condition. It can be applied also to isolated systems. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, we, we made a step beyond. But, but still, uh, there is a problem. Who prepares the system with a given initial condition? Again, it, it is not that you, you no longer need something that, ta that, that uh, takes a, a boundary layer of your system and takes it there with a given uh, non-thermal boundary condition, but still you have to start from there. So you have someone that at a certain point prepares your system. So the uh, interesting fact is that you no, don't really need to prepare the system. You can do something that is a, a bit more natural than this. And this this one. This is related to a different question. So what is, it, it, it appears that what is sufficient is to disturb an equilibrium state and not just to prepare something special. Okay? So uh, let, let's ask a simple and seemingly unrelated question. What happens when you uh, perturb 
a thermal state of a system. Suppose uh, you, you suddenly perturb it. So suppose that you apply a, 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 you know, a sudden perturbation to your system, a big one, huh? a, not a small one that you can treat uh, in a perturbative way, a, a big one, a kick. Huh? We call it a kick. Or maybe you can quench a field. This is more or less the same idea. So you know, if your system is short range, then it will relax to another equilibrium. That's the difference between uh, I mean, usually, when, when the perturbation is small, it will come back to the original. If it's big perturbation, maybe the system changes its energy. I'm, I'm always thinking of isolated systems. So maybe the system acquires or loses some energy, but then it will go to another, or again, to a thermal state. A long-range system, as we know, it will not do that. Okay? It will go to a quasi-stationary state. In general, as uh, Julien told, uh, we don't know which one, okay? But uh, there are some cases in which we know, and uh, we'll have uh, some talks and uh, forthcoming calls uh, will explain us uh, by Fernanda Benetti and Jan Levins uh, that, that there be, in some cases we know what happens, but only in some cases. But we may ask a simpler question, but how, how different this state is from equilibrium, and can, does it have some general features that seem typical? And the answer, is, quite surprisingly to me, is yes. And uh, the fact is that the, the quasi-stationary state you end up with in your system has a non-uniform temperature, if it is non-homogeneous, and displays and exhibits temperature inversion. And uh, it looks like you can even understand why, even, uh, even if still not at a very precise level. So uh, first, I uh, convince you that it works. So you, you take uh, an HMF system, and you prepare it in a cluster state, or magnetized in the mag magnetic point of view uh, system, and uh, in a thermal equilibrium. Okay? Thermal state, but collapsed one. Then you, uh, you evolve it for a while, just to be sure that, that uh, everything stays there. And then you, for example, you switch on an external field, Okay, for a very short time, and then let, let the system evolve. What happens? Okay, what happens is this. The system starts to, the, the mean field in the system starts to develop oscillations, and these oscill oscillations damp out. Okay? And, uh, but the system is very, very far from equilibrium. In this particular case, when the system eventually goes to equilibrium, magnetization will be zero, but you see that uh, magnetization is very far from being zero, and uh, since we have uh, 10 million particles in this simulation, the, the time scale over which you observe equilibrium is very, far, very long, but you do observe that if, if you wait long enough. We, we... Now, and uh, so when you are in a quasi-stationary state that is here eh, for, for a long time here, how does the, the density profile and the temperature profile look like? Exactly inverted this way. You have precise anti-correlation of, uh, uh, so, this, uh, so it works also in this case. And uh, the interesting thing is you can also do the perturbation in a completely different way. You can quench one parameter of, of, uh, of, our, of your system. For instance, you take uh, an HMF model with an external field, and what you do, you quench the value of the field to another one suddenly, okay? Uh, there is a, a lot uh, of business in these years about quenching, even if they are typical in the quantum regime, but the idea is the same. What happens? The same. No? You see exactly the same picture as before. And the same, I, I don't show you the picture, but the same if you quench the coupling constant instead of the, of the field. Again, same thing. So it looks like it is very general, this one. You don't need to do... There is a bonus in the case of quenching. And I thank Andrea for suggesting that it can be done. You could cool the system this way. Because uh, you, what you can do, you, you quench the system. And uh, if you quench it the right way, the average temperature goes down. And uh, at this point, your hot particles are all, uh, in the given positions. So you just uh, get rid of those particles. You, uh, remove the hot particles from the system, and you quench again. And again, the system cools down. And, and again, the system stays in an inverted temperature situation, but cools down. So it's a bonus. I mean, you wanted to do something, you also do something else. 
Uh, okay, so can we go beyond toy models? Yes, we can. Let's start again from uh, astrophysical scales. One very interesting problem is that uh, uh, these inverted temperature profiles are observed not, not only generically in patches of molecular clouds, but in some structures that are very important in these, uh, in these uh, molecular clouds that are called filaments. Uh, they, are, they are nearly cylindrical structures. This is, the, this is an infrared view in three different infrared bands from the Herschel Space Telescope. This is in the Taurus cloud. And uh, you see, you have this... Uh, nearly cylindrical uh, structures. They are very important because they, they play a relevant role in the star formation. And uh, a very basic model that is something more than a toy model that you can do of this uh, structure is uh, to assume a perfect cylindrical symmetry that at least on a, on a finite uh, scale is something reasonable. There are some uh, recent papers uh, uh, on this. As model. And then uh, the problem becomes a 2D gravity problem because uh, you have uh, imperfect uh, cylindrical symmetry. So what happens if you do the same thing? Suppose that you start with a, a, a thermal equilibrium state. Uh, that, that for 2D gravity is well, is well known. That is, for example, the Stryker solution that, uh, that describes the thermal state. And uh, you, you do the same as before and you apply radial perturbation to the system. Okay, what happens? Same thing. You observe the inverted temperature profile, exactly as before. Another very interesting thing is you don't need to start with the thermal state. Huh? You can also do a cold collapse, and it works uh, in the same way. Also, you can put magnetic fields, so you can really go beyond uh, pure toy models in this way. Uh, and then uh, I promised you atomic scales, and here we are. And uh, Julien uh, uh, told you that one of the examples where uh, there are effective long-range interactions that, uh, that emerge is that of cold atoms in an optical cavity interacting with a standing electromagnetic wave. And uh, this is a figure that I stole from the paper by Giovanna Morigi. And, uh, you, the setting, I, I remind you, is, is this one. You have uh, atoms in one dimension that are, that are uh, trapped in a cavity, in an optical cavity, and they interact with a single mode of the electromagnetic field. And uh, if you take the semi-classical limit, and if you assume that dissipative effects are negligible on the time scale that you look at, and this is a delicate issue, and I admit this is a delicate issue, but suppose that you can do that, then it comes out that the model that describes this system is very close, is a mean field dynamics, is a conservative mean field dynamics, and is very close to the HMF. Actually, it's half of an HMF. Instead of the full HMF, you just have half of the magnetization, and then it's very close. And I hope that we'll learn more. Reading from the abstract, maybe these two forthcoming calls will we'll explain much more on, this, on systems like this. Uh, Okay, what, uh, you can do the same again uh, in, on this system. What happens? You, you prepare a system in a regime where the system is magnetized or inhomogeneous. In the, and uh, you, at a certain point, you quench the coupling constant. In, the, in this uh, uh, system, uh, quenching the coupling constant means that you change the intensity of the pumping transverse laser. Okay? You can increase it or decrease it. So, in principle, it can be done. No? This is, I do not claim that this is a feasibility, uh, this is experiment that is feasible, eh, because my knowledge in this is not sufficient. But in principle, it's something that you can do. It's not something that is impossible. Okay? What happens? The same. No? Very similar to, 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 to what we have already observed. Huh? And uh, again, as in the, the HMF case, uh, not surprisingly, which is very close, you can cool the system using, using the same. Uh, I'm not claiming that, that this cooling is very efficient. Probably is not, I mean, is not uh, as efficient as the other. Many, but, but in principle, the idea that you have a different way of cooling in principle is, is not bad since everyone wants to cool down systems, so. <laughs> okay, so which is the physical picture that we have? This point is, is this. You take a long-range interacting system in thermal equilibrium, but not really need that it is really thermal, okay? Because for the gravity, you see also a cold non-equilibrium state works as well. 
you perturb it, quench it some, somehow. What, what really matters is that you bring your system equilibrium in a way such that the mean field starts oscillating in your system. And this is what typically happens in this case, uh, unless uh, you perturb the system in a very specific way. Typically, it does this way. And then what, what happens is that the system, uh, if the system uh, sets down in the inhomogeneous quasi-stationary state, so it doesn't go to a homogeneous regime, then you observe temperature inversions always. No? It's typical. It's not something special. It's, it's the, the rule, not, not, the, not the exception. And uh, so this is a generic feature in, of, uh, of uh, long-range interaction systems because uh, it, it, uh, it, it happens in mean field, but also in more realistic uh, potentials. Attractive repulsion, repulsive works the same way, provided in the repulsive case you have a confining field. Otherwise, clearly, nothing happens. Uh, for the moment, we studied just 1D and 2D. Hopefully, we can do something in 3D, but yet we don't. Uh, this is very robust by changing parameters, protocols, whatever. So it seems really something universal in the, in the, the language uh, said before. So can we understand what's going on? Okay, now, now comes the, uh, and I'm going to the conclusion. Uh, I, I, I think we can understand what's going on, even if we don't have a real theory of that. So we have a physical picture that is very different from a theory. So we can't calculate the profile out of, of, of given, the, but I think we can understand what's going on in these systems. So what is going on? As I told you, the important thing is that your mean field starts oscillating. And you always observe in these numerical experiments. So it is that there is a wave. The perturbation induces a wave in your system. Okay? So, but, but at a certain point, the wave is damped. And uh, Julien told us, how can you wave, uh, damp a wave in a non-collisional system, in a non-dissipative system? You have a very efficient way, that is Landau damping. So, uh, okay, Landau damping, as, as Julien told us, is a very complicated issue in the non-linear regime and whatever, but we, we know, even by uh, papers with, uh, by Julien's group, that it, it happens also in cluster states and not only in the homogeneous states. And uh, the, the wave, this kind of wave-particle interaction have a, a feature that is interesting. They are uh, selective in velocity. So the particles that strongly interact with the wave are those that have a velocity that is, that is uh, sufficiently close with the, with the phase velocity of the wave. If you are completely off resonance, you don't feel the wave. It's only if you are not too far from resonating with the wave that you get. And, uh, this is what you find on all the books and plasma physics. Uh, this, uh, if your particle, that, that is also the picture, if your particle uh, has a velocity that is uh, a bit smaller than the wave velocity of the train, then the, the wave gives velocity to the system. So the, 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 <coughs> the wave loses velocity to the, to the particle system and the, others, the other way around. So now, in typically, the distribution functions that you have are decreasing with, for positive velocities. So what happens? This is the simple way why, why uh, th this kind of interaction that leads to a damping of the wave. Because you have more slower particles than faster particles. So the net effect is that the wave loses energy to the particle system. Uh, but... Uh, then, uh, and this uh, uh, may be close to, to, um, to a question that Michael puts before, one of the signatures of something like that uh, is that after a, if something like this happens, then in the velocity distribution, you should see local changes. So something should change, not you change from uh, a Gaussian to a different shape, but in some more or less localized region, of, uh, of your distribution, you see a shape. Typically, you, you develop a shoulder due, due, due to this. Uh, so does it happen in our system? Yes. You see what's going on. This is the initial, this is for the HMF, okay, so the simpler case. Uh, but also for the gravity is closer to this. Uh, you, this is the initial, uh, the initial Maxwellian. And then 
you see that soon after the perturbation, immediately soon after, all, all these altar symbols are successive time, you see that you have uh, developed the tails. Here, a strong interaction here, and also something here. And, and, all, and the central part is completely undisturbed. Okay? But now, now we understand why you, you get the temperature inversion. Because you have created a suprathermal velocity distribution. And then since the system is uh, um, non-homogeneous, then velocity filtration can work in this system and produce its temperature inversion. You see, because if you now plot the distribution, not the cumulative one, but the distribution at given spaces, you see that uh, this one is the distribution, uh, it, they're all non-thermal, but the tails are much larger when the system is sparse, when the density is low. But it, this is exactly the effect of velocity filtration, nothing more, because you see, you just take this and you rise it. It's exactly the same one that is just reason. Okay, so I'm at the end. Uh, so what, what, what's the take home message uh, from, from this is that uh, temperature inversion is a phenomenon that uh, has been discovered at astrophysical scales. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, I have to be precise. Uh, the, the only, in astrophysics, they, call, they speak of uh, temperature inversion using these words only in the solar corona problem. In molecular clouds, you will not find someone that says that this is a temperature inversion because instead of temperature, they use velocity dispersion. And because in molecular clouds, you have another concept of temperature because you have, you have molecules, no? So you have systems with internal degrees of freedom. What typically is called temperature in those systems is the temperature that you can measure from the uh, you know, level, energy level populations of, of the molecules. It clearly is completely different with that. Because the others are gravitational. The, the molecules seen as particles that interact together and their velocity dispersion, clearly they are completely disconnected with, with, the, uh, with the thermal excitation of the molecule. Typically, the temperature is the, of the order of kelvins, while the, the effective temperature from velocity dispersion is much higher, no? because you have kilometers per second of, of velocity dispersions. OK, this said, uh, my opinion is that uh, the, the various examples that have been seen in astrophysics are not different phenomenon, but, but uh, different realization of a general phenomenon that at a very first approximation can be described by velocity filtration. Clearly then, every system have needs, if you want to be quantitative, quantitative you need to, to introduce the specific uh, properties of each system. So clearly, you can't explain uh, quantitatively the Scudder model that doesn't really work for the solar corona. There are some predictions that are good and some that are worse. But I think we, we, at a zero order, it's a good idea. Then clearly you have to put something more to describe the details. But this idea of velocity filtration can be applied to any long-range interactive system. Okay. And uh, there are minimal ingre ingredients that you need. They, you need long-range interactions so that the, the, the dynamics is Vlasov. You need uh, a clustered steady non-equilibrium states. Clearly, in, in uniform states, you don't observe this. Huh? And you need that somehow fat-tailed velocity distribution can, uh, can be created. But the way you can create it is very easy because it's sufficient to disturb equilibrium. You don't need to do something. Uh, you, you, there is no fine tuning in this. It's just, OK, take your system and kick it. And then, and then it, it, the, the, regardless the way you do that, apart from specific cases, you, you get this. So this is the end. My idea is that we can, uh, we can understand what, what's the physics behind, even if clearly I can't yet calculate uh, the, 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 the profile from, from the initial condition, that would be very nice. So what next? Uh, next would be first to, uh, to study other examples, both in the astrophysical regime and in the down on Earth regime. Especially these are, in my opinion, the 3D self-gravitating, because this will be relevant to molecular clouds that are the cleaner system 
in this way, but also to study this example of particular galaxies could be interesting. Another, uh, other uh, atomic uh, scale systems could be um, trapped ions. Okay, so you have ions in a trapping potential or uh, particle beams, and that they are respectively close to an antiferromagnetic HMF or uh, to a 2D Coulomb system. So we expect that the same thing may happen. And then clearly that would be really, really nice to do experiments and see if we see something like that in, in atoms in a cavity, but also for... Uh... Ah, okay, I was... And I, think, I hope that in the, the, the forthcoming talks we can learn something more on how to do experiments on these systems. And now it would be very nice uh, to turn uh, our physical picture into a theory. And I must, I must admit that for the moment I didn't succeed uh, in doing anything close to that, <laughs> but who knows. And uh, I think that there could be many hints uh, from this conference, uh, uh, I mean, from the papers by Julien uh, on Landau damping uh, in uh, clustered states, for instance, uh, but also from the theories by Jan Levin's group on the possibility of uh, predicting in special cases, but not, not so special, the uh, outcome of the uh, quasi-stationary states from the initial condition. So maybe with Tarsisio, we discussed a lot of uh, how uh, the possibility of applying these this, uh, approaches. That for the moment, we, we, we didn't succeed. I hope that maybe something can be done. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention.